Hello, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a great show for you tonight. We have Amy Gesh here from Whip Air, and we are going to talk float flying tonight. One of the most fun things that you can do in aviation and something that I am looking forward to eventually getting my license to do myself. We're going to learn all about it as well as a little bit about Whip Air uh, and uh, some things that Amy's doing as well. So with no more waiting, let's get started. I'd like to start, uh, as we always do, talking about our takeoffs for takeout program here at Social Flight. Uh, you know, since this crisis started, we have been doing everything that we can to help support uh, local general aviation businesses, FBOs, airport restaurants, et cetera. And so we've got this new logo, maintain aviation social distancing by staying one propeller apart, but keep flying. And that's really the most important thing. And I have to tell you a story. Um, my son, Jake, was uh, uh, over the weekend, went to a local lake beach um, and uh, was just there kind of quietly uh, reading a book, doing some other things. And a steerman came over and flew over the lake and started doing low passes and circles. And everyone that was at this park looked up smiled, kids were running around. It had such a dramatic impact that I just want to pass along more emphasis about how much fun it can be for others when we take to the skies and the inspirational value that general aviation has, especially when you see something as iconic as that Stearman, uh, you know, scooting over the lake and and doing lazy circles. And so I encourage everyone for your own proficiency, for your own ability to stay current, and also just to inspire others to someday become involved in aviation or just to enjoy this wonderful passion that we all partake in. As long as you can do it safely with safe social distancing during this challenging time, please get out there and fly. And so with that, um, one of the things that uh, I'd also like to to show is another uh, little uh, trip that we took. We tried to do something at least once a week uh, to try to get out there and see what's happening and support a local business. Um, this past weekend's trip was to Biddeford, Maine, Old Orchard Beach. And as you can see from some of those pictures, it is it was just absolutely beautiful. We had a, a gorgeous day and after a very challenging winter, to say the least, um, it is really nice to start to see things open up and uh, New Hampshire in particular. Uh, I'm based in Massachusetts and uh, New Hampshire has actually started to open up a little more than some of the other states around. And so that's nice to be able to now see that outdoor seating at restaurants is becoming open um, and uh, people are allowed on beaches and things like that, which is really, really great just to see the world come back to life a little bit. And so uh, we did that. One of the really cool things, every time that I have an opportunity to stop at a new airport and uh, check things out, I get there's always a surprise waiting. And I'm sure that many of you out there have exactly the same experience. When you travel, when you go to new places, there's always a hangar open and every hangar tells a story. And so in this case, I could not help myself. When this hangar was open and I saw inside this plane that I was uh, quite a bit taller than um, and was a one-seat home-built aircraft that was a Z-Max, I had to go over and check it out. And it was really uh, uh, a really neat plane, to say the least. The craftsmanship was excellent. It was a lot of fun to see this at Biddeford, Maine. And uh, then we went from there uh, and uh, took the bikes and uh, biked all the way to Old Orchard Beach and, and uh, supported some of the restaurants there. And of course, uh, if you're gonna be in New England, you have to partake of the lobster roll. And so uh, there's been more than a few of these uh, pictures that have shown lobster rolls and uh, in this case, fried pickles as well. So uh, some pretty cool stuff and, uh, and lots of fun all the way around. And so with that, I would like to launch into uh, tonight's special feature on float plane flying. And uh, I'm going to bring Amy Gesh online now. Amy Gesh is sales manager and whip air specializing in pre-owned piston aircraft and whip line floats for aircraft ranging in size from the Aviat Husky to the Cessna 206. She is seaplane rated, uh, a private pilot with a tailwheel endorsement who owns a Piper Cub herself. We're gonna talk about that as well uh, during the show tonight. And after a start washing airplanes and sweeping hangar floors in high school, she studied marketing and aviation management at Minnesota State University in Mankato. 
With over 10 years of aviation experience in marketing and sales roles, it's fair to say that she gets paid to talk about airplanes. And my understanding, Amy, is uh, nope, uh, no one can have your job if they want it. You've got a good firm grasp on that. It, it's true. It's true. <laughs> well, welcome to Social Flight Live, and thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to join us this evening. Um, you know, as we as we talk, you sent a bunch of pictures through, and I'd just like to I'm gonna flip through some of these while we chat to show people really some of the wonderful majesty uh, of float plane flying. It, it seems to me that of all the different types of aviation, the one that always has these immersive, spectacular pictures, uh, they're float planes. Yeah, absolutely. You'll, you'll notice that uh, in a lot of our ads and in a lot of our copy, we talk about the whole concept of freedom to explore. And I mean, that's, that's the whole idea by it. Uh, there's a wonderful airport network in the United States, but you know, in Minnesota alone, there's over 10,000 lakes. And I can tell you that there are not 10,000 airports. So if you want to really have access to all that Minnesota has to offer, take our clips. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, th the pictures are stunning, and I'm always in, in, enchanted every time that I come across one. So let's start with some of the basics. Um, first of all, uh, you know, the rating itself that people get is a seaplane rating, correct? Yes. And, and yet, um, really, there, there's two different types of, uh, of amphibious aircraft out there, uh, or aircraft that can also go on water. There is technically seaplanes, and then there's essentially float planes, which Whipper specializes in, where you put floats on a variety of different planes. And so, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the different types of aircraft and, and the difference in the, in the there's, is there one rating uh, common to both types? Yeah, in fact, you'll, you'll find that there are seaplanes, which are going to be a water-to-water -water only aircraft. There's amphibians, which are a, a seaplane or a float plane uh, that has the option for paved runways or obviously water landings. Um, but there, there is a third type, which is a flying hull or a flying boat, where you land on the belly of the airplane. Um, it's the same rating across any of them. Obviously, if you learn in something that has straight floats, you want to get transition training for amphibian floats, uh, if you learn in a flying boat before stepping into a float plane, I mean, there are some different considerations. Uh, so there's a wide variety of airplanes depending upon what you want to do, uh, but no matter what, it's the same, you know, it's the same right? airman certification standards, they're mostly practical test standards, you got to remember that, Jane. Um, so it's the same between them, and it's typically going to be about the same amount of time, no matter what you're learning in. Okay. Um, now I'm going to ask you to move in a little bit closer to your microphone. It's a little bit uh, 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 low there. There we go. Um, there we go. Excellent. That'll help out. Uh, and so it, it's, you're saying basically it's the same type of training, and then we'll go into what that is. But it's the same type of training whether someone's going to be flying something like a, a, a Lake Amphibian or a Grumman Goose uh, as it is if they're going to go and equip their aircraft with floats or go out there and acquire one that has floats. That's correct. Okay, and um, now when was when did you get your rating? Uh, I got my rating on Halloween in 2012. Oh, okay. So on Halloween in Minnesota, and I got to do my seaplane rating. So excellent. Our winters I, are long, but sometimes we get a reprieve. <laughs> yeah, well, 10,000 lakes, and they're 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 thawed for I'm not sure how many weeks, but uh, you'll take you'll take advantage of them as much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, and I, let's talk about what's involved in, in getting it. Now, it is technically a rating, correct? Uh, so it's, it's correct. listed, it's airplane, single engine, land, for example, um, it, uh, versus C be, uh, being on there. And what, is, what, is, what does it t typically take for someone if they're interested in, in getting that rating? Most people are going to be able to do it in a weekend. Uh, it's generally speaking going to be about five to ten hours of flying time. Uh, you'll learn things, you know, the airplane itself generally is going to fly the same. So your first hour is going to be a little bit of general airplane familiarization, and then you're going to move on to things like docking, step taxiing, plow taxiing, sailing, you know, all of those water-specific items. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it does, because it's a rating, it is a check ride. Uh, there is not a knowledge test component to it, but you, you are going to take a check ride, and it does count as a flight review, or I should say resets the clock on your flight review. Okay, so check right as in designated examiner. This isn't like a tailwheel endorsement or anything like that. Right. 
Right. So, so you prepare, you can do it in say two to three days, a long weekend. If someone's competent pilot already and already, you know, comfortable with the type of aircraft that they're going to be flying. And, yes. and would you say from looking back on I mean, this things involved in, in learning how to, how to fly uh, with floats? Say again? What are the most difficult things in learning how to fly with floats? It can vary from person to person. Uh, if you are a boater already, things mm -hmm. like being are generally speaking going to come fairly easy to you. Uh, the other handling characteristics and uh, considerations on the wind, a lot of times like step taxiing and maneuvering on the water are going to be that. Uh, it's just learning to not only read the wind, but also learning to read the water. There's the same body of water can be totally different from one day to the next or even from morning to evening. Uh, there's things to watch out for with boat traffic, with um, shifting winds, is an area protected or not protected? Uh, so there's a lot of variability. People who have a marine understanding or if you grew up on a boat, you know, you're definitely going to find it a little bit easier just because you're already comfortable with those same considerations. That makes sense. And and so a good portion of it, from what I'm understanding from you, obviously, is dealing with the aircraft as if it's a boat. And that and does, does that even include the, the un understanding of uh, uh, channels and, and markings and all the things that are that are going to matter for boats? Yes. Yep. So that learning to read those those markings and understanding what that means for safe landing, taxiing areas and also for where you're going to expect to see boats will all be things that are addressed. Excellent. And um, tell, so tell me a little bit about, you mentioned some different things. So sailing, for example, what exactly is that? Sailing is a power off uh, where you're going to say, say we're on the water. And usually a lot of times they talk about it in terms of maneuvering when, uh, you know, you can't get the airplane started or something and you're going to sail it back into position. You can sail forward, you can sail backwards, but it's a really good illustration of how the control placements on the aircraft can affect where you're going and what you're doing. But that's that's just a, a power off. We're going to sail with the wind and you'll uh, like what my instructor did is we picked a spot and aimed for it and we just played with the controls until we could adjust where the airplane was going to be so that you had a, a good hands-on demonstration of how it worked. So you're basically navigating using the wind power off as you mentioned and using the control surfaces in the same way as when we think about uh, taxiing, let's say, or a tail dragger, especially when you think about like, a, here's what you do in a quartering tailwind, or here's what you do in a headwind to keep your tail down, things like that. You're, you're using those same types of things in order to navigate. And uh, you can actually change your course based on that. Yeah, the control placements are gonna, gonna be a little bit different, but that's part of what's fun to, to illustrate as far as how do you put an aileron over to kind of twist the airplane and how can you rudder this way or that way. It's a really interesting illustration of, of how you can use the, the surfaces to land the airplane where you want it to. Hopefully on a beach. <laughs> yeah, so to let, take me through uh, like kind of the basic process. So you've got, if, if you're starting a flight, let's say you're starting from a dock, the, um, take me through the things that you have to do, uh, the skills that you have to use to, to navigate, whether it's that dock, to getting further away, to the, the, the process of, of then taxi and then getting airborne. Well, first you're going to have to do your pre-flight, except uh, if you're learning on a straight float airplane, uh, you're going to have to do your pre-flight pre on the water. So there's a different consideration. How do you check certain things when uh, the option is falling in? or some things may be impossible to check. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps you can look at one wing because the airplane's on the dock, but you're unable to spin it around. In the ideal world, you would spin the airplane around at the dock to finish pre-flighting it. Uh, if you're an amphib like the one behind me, you've got a very tall airplane, so unless you get a ladder, you might not check all the same things that you do uh, on a you know, normal, normal land-based aircraft. Once you've got the pre-flight done, we're going to, you know, get in the airplane. By then, you'll have untied your, your ropes. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes you'll drag one of the ropes with you to kind of control where you're going off the dock and you just drop it in and let it trail behind you. Uh, so there's all these different tactics depending upon, again, the wind situation, the traffic around you. Now that we're off the dock, you know, you've got your water rudders, your water rudders are your power steering while you're in the water. They're connected to the air rudder, so you steer with that. And you can taxi out to your takeoff area. 
if you've flown skis, a run up in a float plane is similar in that there are no brakes, or at least there aren't on straight skis. So you'll do your run up on the run, as we like to say. Mm -hmm. You can always certainly stop and, you know, reset yourself before you take off. But it's something to consider that no matter what you're doing when you're on the water, you are moving. So you right. have to factor it and you have to always pay attention to it. And then, uh, and then you'll go to take off and you'll get to, you know, nose is going to come up and then it'll come up again and then it'll, it'll dip and you'll, you can actually feel it start to accelerate away. They talk about on floats, the sweet spot and the sweet spot is just where that float really becomes very efficient hydrodynamically and it just skims away, but you can feel when you get it, it'll just off it goes. Some of them have very small sweet spots, some of them have very big and forgiving sweet spots. It varies depending upon the float model and the airplane combination. Now, is it similar to a boat in terms of the concept of being on step? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you'll so. Step on step, and then you're skimming along in this just tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of the float. Um, and then off you go as you build up speed and accelerate and fly away. Now, you're generally starting the aircraft while you're, you're at the dock, or do you you pushing away, climbing in, and, and as you're drifting at that point, getting everything started? Depends on the situation. So I've done, I did both with my seaplane rating. Uh, we did it down at our, our seaplane base. So we had a chance to do both. In that situation, there weren't a lot of other airplanes around us. So we often had the, the flexibility to start at the dock. And But even so, sometimes you'll come off the dock in a different way, a kind of a surprising way. And, I'll, you know, so it's nice to have a little bit more control. But I've, I've seen both done. Most of my time was start at the dock and be able to taxi away because you have a little bit more control. Uh, you know, anybody that's done a hot start on an injected engine has had that brief moment of terror where they're like, why won't you start? And if you're still connected to the dock and you have a little bit of influence in where you go, your life is a little bit easier than if you're kind of adrift. In right. Way. And so you basically are pushing yourself off. I mean, you've, I've seen obviously a lot of uh, 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 paddles strapped uh, on, on floats. When are those generally used? Yeah, the paddles are often a they're kind of a, I don't want to say a running joke, but people say, all right, you know, I, like I got a float plane, so I don't have to paddle. Why do you have a paddle? Uh, but the reality is they do come in handy and they're really light and they tuck just on the inside. There's brackets on the inboard sides of the floats for you to carry either one or two with you. Uh, even our caravan floats, and you can't see it because it's on the other side of the computer, uh, but it's a massive set of floats can fit up to a grand caravan. Everybody says, well, why do I need a paddle with a set of caravan floats? Like one, the, the airplane to paddle ratio is a little bit skewed. You know, it looks like a normal size on a Husky and it just looks like a toy on a caravan float. Uh, but nevertheless, it is kind of handy, uh, mostly for if you're coming in the dock a little bit too fast, you got time to get out, grab it, catch it with the, with the paddle instead or pushing yourself off. I have seen somebody paddle in when they misjudged how fast they were coming in and it turns out they kind of stopped a little bit sooner than expected. So uh, it's like most things in an airplane, it's just nice to have another option if you need it and we hope that you'll never need it, but when you need it, you want it. Now, and does Whip Air do both uh, amphibious floats, of course, and, and but also do you do a, a, a number of straight floats? We do. While the amphibs are more popular, we offer both. The trade-off, of course, is that while the amphib allows you to have many more destinations at hand, there is a weight penalty with it. Uh, but it's very location dependent on whether or not a set of straight floats is a good fit for you. They're popular up in Alaska, in places like the Maldives, and in, in uh, the Seattle and Vancouver areas, just because there's so many water destinations, and even here in Minnesota. But if you're in a more limited area, uh, the amphibs do give you a lot more freedom. So they are the bulk of what we produce. Right, and that would definitely make sense. So let's talk types of aircraft. So one of the, the nice things about um, the, uh, uh, the, you know, putting floats on them is obviously you guys put floats on a whole lot of different airplanes. Uh, I mean, behind you, that's what, a Husky? Yeah, it's a PA-12. So we do oh. the, the, and that's a 2100 float, which is the same float that is, I'm going to get this backwards thing right eventually, the same float as this guy. So the 2100 is going to be used on your Aviat Huskies, your Piper PA-12s, PA-18s, American Champion, and Belanca Scouts. Um, it is also used on certain models of the Cessna 172, Cessna 170, and even the Glassstar GS1. 
and I might have forgotten one in there, but it's used on a lot of items. So you can use the same hulls, and what's going to differ is the uh, the rigging kit, the struts to attach it up to the airplane. And mm -hmm. it's kind of an interesting thing because we build floats to what's called a TSO or a technical standard order, and that's going to tell us how we what standards the hull itself needs to meet. Uh, there's a flooded compartment test. There's you know bow and stern loads where you got to try and crunch the float. Um, but then once that float is okay, now we need to put it up under an airplane. We need to engineer a rigging kit for it. We may find some different handling characteristics. We got to go flight test that. And then that is a supplemental type certificate that actually allow us to put our TSO floats under a type right. cert certificated airplane. And that's that's a pretty common thing, right? I mean, there's lots of different areas in aviation with engines and other things where you focus on the product, and that's separate from how that product actually gets attached to a certified aircraft, and, right? And done legally. So, I, I mean, what type of uh, obviously, you know, we see them on Cessnas, we see, and and that there's, that's a gorgeous uh, plane right behind you there. Uh, now you said that uh, you said that one that's just behind you wasn't even on floats this morning, right? It was not. So it came here. We started it, um, I think, about a week or a week and a half ago. And while the airplane's on wheels, we're going to install a hydraulic pump, which goes in a Husky in the baggage compartment uh, aft of the uh, rear passenger. Uh, in the meantime, while it's low to the ground, we can take a lot of the you know compartments out. We can run a lot of hydraulic lines. This airplane is still under the hoist. So it's been pinned under the floats. We still got to put the steps on it. There's some other things that we have to run, including water rudder cabling and finish up some hydraulic lines. And then when we're done with that, we're still going to pick it up. We'll test the gear, make sure everything tests functionally. And then eventually, hopefully by the end of the week, this one will be out from under the hoist and will officially be a float plane. Wow. And that's uh, is it, that's an amphib behind you? It is. Wow, that is beautiful. And and I noticed that, uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, modification to the uh, horizontal stabilizer on that as well. Yeah, so on this one, you are going to see, oh, my fingers out. Ah, this there guy's go. finless. Uh, so the Husky originally, when we designed it, had a ventral fin right here under the tail. And the updated version is these finlets here. So what's nice about either way, uh, they both fit the same purpose, which is to say that when the floats you often need to add directional stability to a float plane. It depends on the airplane. It depends on the certification standards. Even caravans require them, but some aircraft like the Super Cub do not. Uh, the reason that we changed to the finlets was when you have the ventral, ventral fin. There you go. <laughs> the belly, I know we practiced the part where I figured out where to point, Jeff, but like I, I think I'm a lost cause. Nevertheless, when, when that sticks below the airplane, there's two things that it complicates. One is your docking, because now you have something that protrudes below the airplane, and it's a hazard if you spin the tail around that it can hit something. And two, when you're taxiing in a crosswind, because it adds vertical area to, you know, to the form of the airplane, you've given the wind a lot more surface area to push on. So if you're in a crosswind, it's going to try and keep weather veining you. Whereas the finlets are entirely contained in the area of the, the vertical stabilizer and the fuselage. So it has much better handling characteristics in a crosswind. Wow. And and so let's talk a little bit about this. Now, the connection between the floats and the aircraft is solid. Is that correct? There's, there's no form of shock dampening or anything like that? That is correct. It's been, that's something that's been discussed for a long time. And uh, you'll get many different opinions on it. The biggest challenge with it is, that, again, if you're going to add a shock dampening system, you're going to add weight, you're going to add complexity. And there are two things that you will never find when you add floats to an airplane. It's never going to make it faster, and it's never going to make it lighter. <laughs> but it's going to make it cooler. It definitely makes it definitely makes it cool. So, well, I mean, talk about speed for a minute there. What what type of a speed penalty is something like that Husky behind you likely to see? Generally, this one's probably going to lose about 20 miles an hour. So typically, we're going to see anywhere from 20 miles an hour to 25 knots, depending upon the airplane. Wow. Okay. So that's pretty significant. But at the same time, you know, it's opening a lot of doors and, and et cetera. Um, I noticed that one, 
has a whole matching paint scheme going on. Did you, uh, it, was that done before the plane ever even arrived there? It was. So we work with our customers uh, in an ideal world. They, they already have a scheme to match to. In this case, this one was done by the folks over at Scheme Designers. So they were able to give us a match that set on the floats. Uh, otherwise, we've gotten everything from napkins. We've gotten people that say, hey, plain white. We do need to paint the floats to send them out the door. Uh, so, like I said, it's wild to wild. This one has some specialty metallic paint on it and a couple of extra masking steps. Uh, we do have a standard paint allowance, and then if you get a little fancier, we just charge you for the difference, depending upon what your what your airplane's like. Got it. And I, and I assume that uh, one last step to happen to the one behind you also is going to be getting rid of that little tail wheel. It will come off. Yep. Yep. Is that it? it now. How, I mean, like that particular t aircraft, for example, is it the kind of thing that it is uh, straightforward to convert back and forth later in life uh, for the aircraft, uh, seasonally or otherwise, or is it pretty much like this for a while? Seasonal changes are always going to be easier because they assume that you leave the hydraulic system in the airplane. Uh, there are some float manufacturers that keep their hydraulic pumps in the floats. That's something that we used to do. Uh, about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, in our case, we found that uh, floats get to be a little bit humid. You know, they've got compartments in them and they're in and out of the water. So uh, they would get humid and it wasn't, you know, necessarily the best environment for a long lived hydraulic system. If you have those kind of floats, it's a very easy swap. Uh, but if you leave the hydraulic system in the airplane, um, like if you leave it in this Husky, you'll you'll be swapped in a day. If really? You do it, yep. If you want to take it permanently out, you are going to spend a bit more time on there. I would probably plan on three to four days. It, you know, for a Husky, it can vary uh, because you're going to want to pull out things like your water rudder cables. And you want to do so in a way when you remove a set of floats to sell in the future, you want to take as many things as you can. Like if it's not riveted in, take it out. And then you also want to keep it complete. I've seen people clip water rudder cables when they because it was easier to remove them, and yeah, <laughs> make them. But now it's something else for your buyer to do, and it you know can impact the value of the floats and how easy it is for the future owner. Uh, so right. it varies based on what you're doing, but even a caravan seasonal changeover can be done in a day and a half to two days. That's that's impressive. I, I wouldn't have thought that it's only only a one day changeover if you're looking at a seasonal type thing. You know, you want to be able to fly in the winter, put skis on, or just uh, just fly with normal tires in the winter and, and only use your floats during the summer. Uh, one day doesn't doesn't seem like a big deal to convert over. It's not bad. I mean, uh, we have some Canadian customers. Uh, we haven't seen them yet, obviously because of the coronavirus situation, and but they are the typical. Uh, they bring spring to us and they also bring winter to us. They they come down and when they come down, it's the first thing. It's like, all right, all right, the snow's going to come out. The Canadians are here. And when they come back in the fall, you're like, oh, come on, go back home. Like, because it means it's going to get cold. And what they do is they fly down one evening. They go to the Mall of America or, or you know, run their errands while they're here. And then the next afternoon, they hop in their caravan and take it on home. Wow, that is, that's pretty cool. So, <laughs> Tell me about some of the different planes and, and what your favorites might be. I mean, a little bit earlier we showed, for example, uh, De Havilland Beaver. I mean, that God, that that's a pretty iconic looking thing on floats. Um, what what are your favorites? What are some of the coolest things that you've seen on floats by Whip Air? Oh, there's there's a lot of really cool stuff that we do. The Husky's a lot of fun. I got my rating in a, C, a Super Cub, which was great because I've, I've got a fair amount of Cub time. And so to me, there's not much that beats a a fun small airplane. Um, our Box 182 is amazing as far as a really practical, high performance application. Uh, you can't beat the nostalgia of a beaver. Uh, I've not been in a radial beaver, but I have been in a turbine beaver, which really kind of takes the performance level up on steroids. Um, but for real practicality, the, there's a reason that they call the Cessna Caravan the Swiss Army knife with wings, because it's just really good at whatever it does. It's a comfortable flying airplane and I've had the chance to fly right seat into into Maine in one. And it feels like such a huge airplane. There's an approach coming into Greenville where you come, depending upon where the what direction the wind is, you'll come over the city and oftentimes there's sailboats out and you know 
when you fly a caravan, well, you fly it like a big 172 and you can yank it around like a little airplane, but it's just a hulking, massive airplane on floats. And it was just, it was very cool to see it. And, and of course, that unique sensation when you slide forward in your seat when they pull the prop back is also really weird. So if you're not prepared for it, it's a surprise, but we've got all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, they my are favorite, always. They are always such impressive planes, those uh, those caravans, and and especially I love seeing them every year at Oshkosh at the Whip Air booth. That because again, like you said, they're massive. I mean, you have to climb up so far to do it, and yet you see them in urban environments, right? Because you see them docking outside Manhattan, you see them outside of Seattle, and any any city that's right on the water tends to have caravans on floats. Um, and it's pretty impressive to think that from a piloting perspective, it's not much different from the 172, 182, 200 series aircraft. Yep, uh, the Cessna demo pilot told me, I asked him about it, he said, oh, no, it's, it's so giant. And he said, no, it flies like a big 172. Just fly like a 172. It doesn't even go that much faster, you know, when, when you slow it down, because it's just got massive flaps on it. So right. it's a very small right. airplane. Outside my price range, but if you can, if you can pull it up, you should go for it. <laughs> You know what? It's, it, there's a reason that we have flying clubs, right? Everybody pull your money. We're all going for a caravan on floats. Going in a caravan. I'll be there with you. Excellent. And so now the, the aircraft that we've got up on the screen right now is Whip Air's Boss 182. So now when, you know, we've talked about people like what types of planes are on floats and how, a little bit about how to get your rating and what to look for. And we'll come back to some of that. But there's also obviously the opportunity to take the plane that you have now and if it's applicable to it put it on floats i don't think i'm, I'm not sure that uh that, that you guys would be happy if i did that pulling up in the bonanza but uh i think you, if i had the 182 here we'd get away with it yeah absolutely could i mean we've got whippers got over 100 stcs and, and not all of them are specific to float planes oftentimes what makes an airplane a good float plane make it just a generally good performing airplane uh, so we, the Boss 182 is a Lycoming IO580 engine conversion. It puts out 315 horsepower out of the box. If you do the optional porting and polishing, it's it's more like 350, uh, which we just did on the airplane in that picture, and it's a, it's a whole new animal. Uh, so we've seen a relatively even split on those airplanes between being float planes and just being really high-performing land planes. So everything from cross weight increases, propellers, engine conversions, so we see a lot of those, and there's a lot of airplanes that, you know, you don't necessarily think of that can be good float planes. Mm -hmm. And and so what are so you said bigger engine on that? I see that there's a ventral fin. So if someone someone comes to you with uh, with 182, um, uh, a you said that that you can make modifications to it just even as a straight regular a land based plane. Um, with some of that, but then this whole package includes a whole, uh, which items actually are part of this? As far as the Boss 182 engine conversion, it's going to be the engine. There's an optional engine mount and the propeller. Uh, we recommend the Hearts of Trailways propeller. Uh, there are a couple other options, but that's been the best combo of the performance for us. Uh, when you get to the floats, uh, the seaplane engine mount is also recommended, even if you don't do the engine conversion, just because. Uh, you can take advantage of some higher gross weights. Uh, you'll notice that the struts on this Boss 182 come into the sides of the firewall. Earlier ones came up to a point at the nose gear, and the nose gear was the weak point of it. So this allows us to offer you some additional gross weight increases. The 182 was never offered with a factory float kit from Cessna, so there's a fair amount of work that needs to be done to prep that airplane and put it on floats, which includes things like that ventral fin. Okay. And is, it, is there also structural work you've got to do to, to beef the, the structure of the aircraft up itself to be able to be a float plane? Yep, there's like firewall beef ups and a couple things inside the fuselage as well. Is that kind of, uh, some of that related to what we were talking about before where um, when you, you are, aren't putting any type of shock absorption system in, in generally into a float plane, you, the water's still hard. And so um, you, those loads get transferred more directly. Is that part of the reason, or is it all just the weight that, that, that you're dealing with? It's typically going to be your water landing loads and your land landing loads, um, more specifically on the water. But yes, it, because there's no absorption, it gets transmitted into the fuselage of the aircraft. So what are the coolest uh, seaplane, float planes that, that you personally have flown? Um, 
You know, the Boss 182 ranks up there as far as things that I've logged time in. That's probably up there as well as, you know, probably the Husky and the Super Cub. Haven't had a chance to log time in a Beaver or a Caravan yet. Uh, we're going to have to to remedy the uh, the caravan one. I think that there's got to be something hanging around one of the hangers there uh, at at Whipper. Matter of fact, uh, I have this next picture up right now of of one of your uh, your hangers, and uh, it it must be pretty small because uh, you've got a lot of airplanes in there, and they're caravans. So uh, it's uh, how big are these hang these hangers? You said you have a, a, quite a few of these. We do. So I can't remember exactly how much square foot of space that we have, but the hangar that I'm in, we've had up to five caravans in here. Um, our storage hangers, that's not abnormal for them either. The nice thing about being on floats is that you can kind of Tetris, the, you can not only Tetris, you know, from a top view, but you can Tetris vertically too. You can tuck a, a land plane under, under the wing of a caravan without much issue. Wow. So I think it's, north of 100,000 square feet of hangar space. I, I can't remember, there's some great specs on our website, but yeah, we've got, we've got a lot, a little bit of room. You know, years ago, I uh, I came and, and toured your South St. Paul facility. It is it is so impressive to see uh, what goes on there. And we'll bring up a couple more of these slides as you look at how these how these are made. Um, walk us through a little bit of this. This is the construction of the, uh, uh, of the floats themselves. Yeah, across the airport, we have a manufacturing facility that handles everything from part production, like the bulkheads that you see uh, in the pictures here, all the way up to, you know, our other modifications and kits and everything flows through there. Uh, a float is built upside down. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll make the top deck its own assembly. It starts as a flat piece of aluminum. Then we start to add holes for things like baggage covers and inspection covers. We'll start to beef that up to give it a little bit of structure so it's not just, you know, now it's a, a piece. Then you're gonna lay it down and that's gonna form, you know, what you build everything off of. So they're built upside down and then we're gonna put our bulkheads in and we'll put our side skins on and then we'll start to put other stiffeners and start to build it up. Um, most floats are built in four stations. Some are built in four and a half just to spread out the, the workload so that things move through you know, evenly and consistently. Uh, it's not until about station three that they flip over and they're finally on their bellies because that's where at the point where, at least for an amphib float, that we're putting landing gear in. Wow, and obviously, how do you, you know, they have to be watertight. So how does, how's that done? Is it, it, it you th I, when I think of it, it must be somewhat similar to how wet wings are done for fuel. Pretty similar. Uh, when we build our piece parts, it starts at that level. So you'll start with a small stiffener, okay? And then we're gonna go and say, we gotta go press it and bend it so that it's, it's like a, shaped like an L. Now we're gonna go send it to primer. In the meantime, we're gonna go press our bulkhead, you know, our piece that's shaped kind of like this. Uh, then we're, so we're gonna go form that and then we're gonna go send that off and we're gonna go prime it. Now, when it comes time to put that stiffener on the bulkhead, First, we're gonna roll a sealant on the bulkhead. We're gonna roll a sealant on the stiffener, and then we're gonna stick them together. And then we're gonna rivet them together. And then we're gonna take, um, I think they use a, a P2 sealant. I can't quite remember. I'm sure it's in our maintenance manual. And they draw a bead along it, make sure that's all pretty now that they're stuck together. And then it goes and it gets primed again. So wow. there's several layers to make sure that it's always got good prevention. So those rivet lines are gonna be sealed in there. Well, you always hear, obviously, that uh, the challenge with any aircraft is if you're going to be near water, and that's always the worry about the aircraft, but it sounds like there's an awful lot that goes into making sure that the floats themselves are made to survive for a long time in those types of conditions. Yep, and this it, it's important to note that we've been doing this a while, so we've learned a few things along the way. In fact, 2020 is the 60th anniversary of whipline floats, so we've been building floats continuously uh, for 60 years now, and uh, wow. like I said, We've learned a few things along the way about how to make sure that they're they're long lived. Some of our initial floats are still out there, still operational, and off doing float plane things. And so when you see, I mean, I've seen a fair amount of people go in uh, in this part of a pre-flight for flying with floats, um, uh, open up the chambers and pump out any water in there. Is that generally condensation that they're dealing with, as opposed to any any type of leaks that happen? Typically, yes. Uh, just again, because if you come to a show, you can often flip open a float compartment 
and just the nature of the beast is that when it sits out in the sun it gets warm you'll open it up and you'll get this nice warm craft of air to you know really send send home the ash cash experience you know <laughs> after you've been out in the sun all day you're like whoa um smells like primer uh so <laughs> they are sealed on top there's a, a rubber foam rubber seal that goes around the edge they're also got lips so if you look at the best way to do this so if this is the top deck of your float there's a little lip here yep seal goes around it to help prevent anything from coming in the majority of leaks do come from the top of floats you can replace those seals and if it's been a few years or if they're drying out that's usually the issue mm, kind of like the way if you have to worry about with fuel caps you know you got to seal it from the top down because that's where water is going to eventually pull from rain or anything else or condensation or dew yeah, exactly excellent that, that makes sense now um Obviously, uh, you guys do a lot more than even just floats. So uh, you've got a maintenance shop, you got a paint shop, interior shop, avionics shop, all of that at your South St. Paul facility. And uh, this looks like to me, I'm going to look at that door and say that, and the engine there, I'm going to say that's a caravan. You would be correct. It's, and in fact, if you look a little closer, you'll notice it's a wingless caravan. Uh, yep, that's true. <laughs> That one came in for an extensive rebuild, and I think we ended up doing a full strip and repaint on that one as well. So we're capable. We've got, uh, we've actually got, depending upon the airplane, we even have fuselage fixtures so that we can straighten your airplane uh, wow. or check to make sure that it is straight. So we do a lot of heavy maintenance. We do, but we also do little things like oil changes and you know small ADSB work all the way up to I want to put a Garmin everything in my panel and. You know, here's my blank check. So there's a wide variety of corners of the market that we serve and then aircraft that we serve as well. Uh, you'll see a lot of Cessnas in our facility because we're a single engine service center to include, you know, all the piston line as well as the caravan line. But we're also a Viking factory endorsed service center for the Twin Otter. And we see obviously anything that we put on floats we can work on and we're comfortable with. Wow. And so obviously, you know, you're dealing with some heavy structural work in terms of floats and then, um, uh, that and you've got to paint them. And so part of all that, all the different things that go into the core business is what gives you then the ability to provide those as external services as well. Correct. I mean, the more control that we have over all of our processes, the better end product we can give the customer. So we know we know we need to paint floats. So why not have a paint shop and do a really world class job at it? We know right. we're going to hire you a gear advisory, you, you know, better done by an avionics expert. Why don't we have an avionics shop? And same with, with interior. We're going to rip the interior out of your airplane. It's going to be here a couple of weeks. It's a perfect time to do all of those upgrades. And then you get to do them all at one time. So instead of taking your airplane from a paint shop to an interior shop to an avionics shop, take it for one period of time, one right. and done. Now, you mentioned gear advisory. So let's talk about that for a second, because one of the things uh, that, that's so, so important about uh, float plane flying is the criticality of gear down on water type landings and things that can happen. We've, we've heard about the accidents with that, and it, it's it's a big deal. And so my, uh, I, I've seen Whip Air, you have uh, a laser uh, gear system that you've designed that's part of your floats. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, well, let's take a step back and let's go through the generations of gear advisory systems quickly, uh, just to give you an idea of where the industries come from and how we are continually working to improve on that. Your first system was going to be a mechanical indicator or something like a mirror to see is it up, is it down. You know, you're going to look at the handle, yep, handle says up, handle says down, let's look outside, okay, looks about right. Uh, then to provide, you know, more visibility to it, we added things like lights for green, for blue. Now you can see each individual gear because in something like, say, a 182, if I'm left seat in it, I can look out, I can see my main gear, I can look forward, I can see my nose gear on the left look. I can't see the right one. So it's nice to have the lights. Then we add on top of that an airspeed-based system. And what that system does is there's a little switch, and you set the... You set the airspeed depending upon the airplane. Like I just looked up the Husky, so I know it's 75 miles an hour. If you slow below 75 miles an hour, switch closes, and then it's going to tell you gear is down for water landing or gear is up, or, or gear is down for runway landing, gear is up for water landing. And they say it in two different voices. There's a male voice and a female voice to help you differentiate that. That system isn't smart. Anytime that you slow down, it's just going to give you a factual statement of where your gear is 
And we found that people could tune that out. Uh, the other thing is that you had to acknowledge it. So you would say, yep, got it. And that would shut it up. And sometimes people didn't want to listen to it, so they just shut it up and, you know, carry right. on. They got sent out on a, a long base or, a, you know, following someone and finally don't want to listen to it. Now they're not thinking about it. Uh, so then, and again, they're repetitive. They never change. So people would sometimes tune those out, have a perfectly functioning gear advisory system, and still land with the gear in the improper position for the surface they were landing on. So the last rendition of that says, okay, how can we make it smarter? How can we eliminate those issues? And we've done that by putting a laser out in the wing. Now, this one, see that little <laughs> thing there? There we go. Point to the laser. There's, there's going to be a laser that goes there. And now we're adding another layer. So you have to be low enough, you have to be slow enough, and then at 50 feet above the surface level, if there is a mismatch detected between the detected surface and your gear position, it's going to tell you to check gear. So the goal is that it's only going to squawk at you when there's something wrong. That way you never get in the habit of tuning it out. We also added when you accelerate, and again in the case of the Husky, once you accelerate past 75 miles an hour, if you haven't pulled the gear up within 10 seconds, it's also going to remind you to check your gear. And the reason for that is it's always going to be safer for the gear to be up. It gets a little expensive if you do it on land, but better expensive than dangerous. So we always want the gear up. So if you don't retract, it's going to remind you. It's timed based around uh, reports that we've had from the field where people get radio calls or a passenger is asking them questions, and it's very easy to forget. Now, you talked about flying a bonanza. Well, if you leave the gear down in a bonanza, like eventually you're going to notice that your bonanza is going a little bit slow. Sorry to say on a full plane, you're probably not going to notice that much of a difference. So it's an additional reminder, an additional right. cue. You still have all the lights. We have mechanical gear indicators on the top decks of the floats as well. So there's several layers of safety that we keep building up to. Right. And we want to point out, of course, that, that it's, as opposed to just something like a laser altimeter, your laser actually can tell the difference between land and water. That is correct. So that's a, that's a pretty cool thing uh, as well on that. Now, we mentioned other modifications here, and uh, I've got one on the screen. And I also want uh, to remind viewers that, that, that they can modify the sizes of the uh, video. We've gotten some questions in here. If you want to see the webcams larger, you can stretch that out yourself versus the uh, PowerPoint here. But um, you've got a mod here that is uh, for those caravans, one of the sweet spots of Whipper's business. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is our new extended baggage modification. Previous extended baggage mods for the caravan were often uh, very utilitarian. They weren't accessible in flight. And even though the caravan has its roots as a very utilitarian airplane, we'll often see it outfitted you know, as a nice airplane, whether that means executive interior or you know, fewer seats for more room. You'll see that happen. So instead of putting this you know, very basic extended baggage in there, we designed this. This can be finished with a veneer. Uh, you know, you can put your golf clubs back there. If you need to get something in flight, you're able to open it as well. Excellent. And so that's a good modification there. Now I have uh, one other uh, cool picture here for everybody, and and that is the Fire Boss. You talk about a cool picture. <laughs> yeah, it's is. You know, people often ask us like, oh man, I want to. I wish I could get a job flying seaplanes. And the reality is, you can. Uh, that could be flying caravans in places like New York or Florida, uh, Twin Otters in the Maldives, or it could be flying firefighting airplanes anywhere from Canada, Australia, out to the western United States, and even, even here in Minnesota as well. Uh, so those floats have a scoop in the bottom. They scoop the water. It goes up through a giant tube. It's about this big. Uh, and then it loads into the hopper of the airplane because, you know, the air tractor being in starting its life and having a basis as an agricultural aircraft as a tank between the engine and the pilot. Actually, has wow. two, so they don't slosh. And it, it, have you seen these up close? I mean, that is one radical looking well, ag, ag plane. They're monster <laughs> airplanes. I mean, you don't realize how big they are. The air tractor is kind of the exception to the rule of most float planes are high wing airplanes. Uh, one, it doesn't matter if you're a fire boss because you're bigger than just about anything on the ramp except maybe a twin outer. 
And two, you, you never really stop as a fire boss. Like you're down and off you go, so you don't have to worry about docking. Yeah, and, and is that the biggest reason for high wing versus low wing? Is, is it, it, it when it comes to, to seaplanes or, or at least going on floats, is it really basically about the docks? Yep, absolutely. Uh, low wing airplanes, you know, it, there's a lot of docks out there that are boat friendly that may have large pilings. Those aren't really seaplane friendly. Even in something like a Husky, you got to watch out for the, you know, the struts. Uh, but if you're in something like a lake, you need a really flat, low dock. So having a high wing airplane just gives you more options. Right. Well, that is uh, that is an impressive uh, plane with the Fire Boss, and I assume that that's a, a, a special whole kit that's that's done by Whip Air. Yeah, it's a it's a whole ordeal. It's one of the more impressive modifications that we do because we also have to tie into the fire gate, which is a hydraulically control, controlled set of doors on the belly of the airplane, where the pilot up top can dial in coverage levels and how they want to drop. And then it's all computer controlled and, and off they go. You can also dial in how much water you're going to pick up and the scoops will act, you know, automatically retract when, when oh, you wow. tap. So that's yeah. a whole, that, and, and so that's all automatic. The scoops deploy, scoop up the water, load up the hopper and, and, and set themselves up. And, and how fast is the plane going during this process? Oh, I think it's about 80 knots. I, I don't quote wow. me up. But 80, it's, 80 it's knots during the pickup. So they're on step the whole time that they're picking up water. The and then pick up. This is a full power endeavor because you're, you're going to come up with uh, it on, uh, on floats with the fire gate installed, the capacity of that airplane is 820 gallons. And I can't remember how much a gallon of water weighs, but it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so. Wow. So you do not want to be uh, filling up and then taking off from don't a stop. stop. Right. Yeah, don't, don't stop. <laughs> That's uh, that is impressive. I'm looking forward to seeing one of those soon, and uh, yeah. that's 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 definitely impressive. So let's take a minute now and switch gears because you've got some of your own stuff going on here, and I do not want to miss that, even though we're uh, we're close to running out of time. And that is your own Cub project. So you you know I, my heart is is with people who do who work on their own planes. Absolutely love it. Love to teach about it, every aspect of it. And as you can see behind me, obviously we got our own project going on here. And maybe someday we'll we'll see if we can uh, uh, beg a way to put a T our T51 onto floats. But you have been working on a cub restoration for how long? Eh, it's been almost four and a half years. It's it's been a long time. But you know, the part of the reason for that is I wanted to do a lot of the work myself. One, because it's a good way to get to know an airplane. And two, let's be honest, it's a lot cheaper if I do all the grunt work. Um, I'd rather not pay somebody to, to be sitting there scotch writing and sanding everything, you know, the brainless stuff. Like, I'm pretty good at brainless work. Um, <laughs> professionals for complicated stuff. But uh, the picture in the lower right is the, the last picture of her as a flying airplane before she got taken apart. And the picture oh, that's the, the before. That's the before, yeah. So, um and the picture in the upper left is when they made me cut out some bent tubes in the back. Because nothing, you know, nothing feels quite so great as, as when the guy in the shop says, oh, well, we've got to cut the tail off your airplane. And like, that's bad enough already. And then, and then they hand you the grinder and they're like, here, you should do it. You do it. <laughs> you, do, you amputate your own leg. There you go. Exactly, exactly. Hmm. Oh my God! Well, it, I mean that it's it's gorgeous. It must have been a really uh, interesting process to go through, and we have a we have another another one here that shows a slide that shows everything that that you did. Um, and so four and a half years working on what year is the plane? Uh, it, she is a 1946 J3 with a PA11 conversion. So she's a little bit of a hodgepodge airplane. That's uh, that's really amazing. It certainly looks like you. And how long have you owned it? Uh, I bought it in April of 2014, so it has been in pieces longer than it has been flying. Um, yeah, I can help you not make the same mistakes, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to need a recover when I bought it, uh, but the, the long and short of, of rules of buying an airplane are if you buy something that you know is going to need work, it's going to need work sooner than you think. If you think it's five years down the road, it's probably two. Uh, and no matter how prepared you are, it's probably going to take a little bit longer and it's going to cost a little bit more than you expected, but such is the nature of projects. 
this is this this you know it's all it's all a, a form of of tuition right we're all when when we get involved and you buy an airplane you're you're paying for an education as much as you're paying for the airplane and that doesn't have to be a bad thing um you know there's there's a lot of people that have come out it with uh, a and p licenses eventually and so there's there's really good ways to do it you get to log your time and you certainly i hope you've logged this because i'm a huge advocate of everyone eventually putting in enough time to uh, start the process of getting themselves licensed as a mechanic? Well, you know, I'd, I'd have to look back. I didn't keep track of it, mostly because, like everything, I thought, oh, I'm going to be done in a couple of months. It's very <laughs> naive, uh, but nevertheless, you know, you're like, yeah, it'll be, done. it'll be done. You know, why start counting now? It's just going to be done so soon, and then here we are. But uh, hopefully she'll be coming home soon. Uh, we just had, so we've done the first flights. I've put several hours of flight time on it, uh, and then, we just wanted to, you know, like any project, there's a couple little things we wanted to tidy up before she comes home, but the hangar's cleared out. I've even ordered a big Lebowski rug for my Ooh. hangar. You know, you need something to really tie the room together. Absolutely. That's a, and of course, the next big question, when are the floats going on? Uh, not this summer because I've got a couple wheel destinations, mostly because I've got four and a half years of flying trips that I need to take. Um, but I do have a set of floats in the hangar for it, so uh, maybe as soon as next summer. Uh, but I, I do want to put a starter in the airplane for that. It being a no electric airplane does require a hand propping on it, so uh, which is much easier to do on wheels than it is on floats. But my engine is compatible with a battery powered starter, so I would do that before I put it on floats because I can't do the prop from behind thing. I don't know, I guess. That wouldn't have even occurred to me. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, that definitely makes a lot of sense. So, um, Amy, I just want to thank you for taking the time of coming on. 2020 is the 60th anniversary of business for Whip Air. There are so many, you know, I've had some exposure, obviously, in working with Whip Air uh, and you guys as a partner. There's so many cool things that you do. Uh, I can't wait to come out and visit again and see the Onyx shop. And uh, like I said, uh, maybe we'll find a way to get involved in our Mustang as well. And so I just thank you for taking the time of doing this, giving us a little bit more knowledge about uh, float plane flying and maybe we can inspire at least uh, one or two people out there to take that long weekend to take that two to three day weekend and get the rating see what it's like uh, see what it's like to leave airports behind and open up all of these destinations off airport on the water uh, and uh, uh, bring uh, bring your uh, your fly fishing rod or whatever you need to to get out there and and, and enjoy it so again thank you so so much for joining us Awesome. And when you do get your seaplane rating, don't forget to check out our uh, seaplane rating medallion program. So check Ooh. it out. When you do get your rating, go to whipair.com slash medallion, and we will send you one of these, and we custom engrave it with your name, the date that you got your rating, and the aircraft and floats or flying boat that you got your rating in. And it does not need to be with flying floats. We just want to see more float plane pilots, and it's a great way to commemorate something cool that you did. What a wonderful thing. That is a great idea. I plan on eventually getting one of those then. That's, uh, that's, that's really fantastic. Well, Amy Getron Whipper, thank you so much for taking your time to joining us. Uh, uh, like I said, hopefully someone will get out there. I want to see some of those medallions go out there to viewers. And uh, again, join us back here. We are here every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Social Flight Live. We have some great shows coming up. Uh, uh, next Tuesday on June 9th, we have Corey Robin from the Flying Cowboys. We're going to go from off airport landings on water to off airport landings on the on the land and what's involved in stall takeoffs and, and that whole awesome world. On June 16th, we're joined by Kirby Chambliss, uh, an, another amazing guest. We're going to have a lot of fun stuff. And on June 23rd, we have Mike Bush coming back. We're going to talk all about engine analytics predictive modeling, and all the other cool things that go into maintaining your aircraft. So again, thanks so much to Whip Air. Thank you to everyone for joining us and taking this time out of your night and supporting general aviation. Get out there and fly. And to all of you, blue skies.